Due to the nature of these photographic educational tapes, color bars are presented as a reference for your television. Adjusting the hue on your set to match this chart will ensure the highest quality reproduction of the images on this tape. Commercial photography as a profession is relatively young uh, compared to all the other professions in photography. Because of that, we, it is really not a craft right now. It's kind of a bag of tricks. We go, we assist, we study, we watch what a photographer is doing, then we go open our own studio and kind of repeat what we've been, been, uh, been seeing. Nothing unique about it, really redoing what's already been done. But if we can stop for a moment, treat it as a profession, but organize the craft in a very thought-provoking process to, to where you have a, a much more concise ability to create what hasn't been created because you understand the craft and then your imagination can pretty well do it as, as you want. Photographing the highly reflective surfaces of these dress watches requires an understanding of specular highlights and diffused highlights. Using a single light source, Collins retains complete control over this simple yet elegant photograph. Lots of different types of jewelry are photographed. Uh, in each piece of jewelry is going to offer you a different type of problem in lighting because when you light jewelry, uh, the job is to produce a two-dimensional representation, a photograph, often for a magazine or a, a catalog, to where when you look at the... Um, to look at the, uh, the, the shot is to sell, to identify surface quality, glass, crystal, is it gold, is it silver, um, the clarity, does it have leather in it, uh, sometimes they have metal mixed with leather, and there's lots of different surface qualities. So when you light it, you have to identify all shapes and all forms. Some reflections you want, and other reflections you do not want because they hide certain tonalities or certain shapes within the jewelry. So, so lighting jewelry is probably one of the, uh, one of the true forms of illustrative lighting, to where you really have to have a master of shadow form to diffuse form to specular form, and specular edge transfers to shadow edge transfers. There's a, a lot of characteristics in lighting these small intricate piece of jewelry that you're going to zoom in close, make 4x5s and 8x10 chromes up to where you can identify all shapes and all forms and all textures. Collins begins the shoot in his studio by rolling out a 3 and one half foot roll of paper architectural vellum. A light form P22 frame is set up and laid directly over the vellum, making a perfect fit. Light form single clips are used to secure the vellum to the frame. Using several clips helps to create and control the tension of the paper while attached to the frame. Excess vellum is then removed to create a simple and lightweight scrim. Two light form EC1 clamps are then attached to light stands and are tightened down to form solid connectors for the scrim. The P22 panel and vellum are then connected to the clamps, forming the overhead scrim. Collins then utilizes two small saw horses and two particle board planks to create a low and inexpensive tabletop work area. A sheet of white foam board with photographic leader paper is used as a working surface to set up the watches. 
the different materials that we're going to work with, both, both the tabletop surface and the sur items that we lit with, are, are going to be uh, simple materials. To light, uh, to light jewelry, you're going to work with a lot of reflections uh, of the light sources. We'll call it specularity. If we work with our normal material, ripstop nylon, and lit through that, you would actually be able to see in, in parts of the faces of the watch and some of the uh, various polished gold, you'd see reflections of the ripstop fiber. We didn't want that. So we lit through uh, architectural tracing vellum, uh, which you can buy at a graphic art supply store, and that gave a very uh, clean specular highlight in the watches uh, and in the, uh, the, the fine, fine parts of the, uh, the glass. The surface that it was laying on was, uh, it was a black polished paper, it was photographic leader paper, which they just throw away at labs, you can pick it up at no charge. But what it offered us was a very smooth surface, but yet not so smooth that it picked up a perfect definition of the small gobos, which we were going to remove the reflections in the glass with. It, it picked up, instead of perfectly round circles on, on the uh, surface, it picked up a very gradated edge between what we'll call the diffuse highlight and the speculate, the black area being the diffuse highlight, and the white washed out area of the black paper uh, being the specular highlight. That edge transition right there is called the specular edge, uh, which is controlled by several things, one being surface efficiency. So we didn't choose a black plexiglass, as a lot of people would. We chose a black paper, which had a little bit of a reticulated surface to it, which created a soft gradation between one brightness and the other, this one being the diffuse to the specular highlight. A bearable bronze color strobe is placed on a boom stand and positioned over the scrim to create an even transition burst on the vellum. Double clips hold two light form P22 panels with black ripstop nylon on top of the scrim, acting as a gobo for the camera and the background while containing any ambient light spill. White reflective material was not used for the inside of the tent because the bounced light would evenly illuminate the vellum and ruin the burst effect. Power cables are then connected to the Pulso 4 power pack and Collins sets the appropriate power and checks the operation of his strobe. Dean rolls in a tool cabinet carrying all of his photographic needs for a tabletop set and begins to work on the shot. An art director's layout of the proposed photograph is set next to the work area as Collins begins setting the watches up in the proper gradation area. As Collins works on the setup, he eyes the watches from the camera angle of view to ensure proper placement relative to the reflection of the light source on the paper. Once Collins is pleased with the setup, he tapes the watches down with masking tape to hold them securely on the slick surface of the paper. Collins places the tape far enough from the watch faces so they will be out of the frame for the photograph. The FOBA camera stand is then dropped into place with a 210 mm DB lens on a Cinar P2 4x5 camera. Collins glides the horizontal support arm to its fullest extent to create plenty of workspace in front of the watches when the camera is pushed out of the way. An extension rail is added for the camera bellows extension that will be required for this type of close-up photographic work. Because the image is extended over such a distance, the image intensity drops on the film plane. Collins adds a 45 degree viewing hood for viewing ease. Dean adjusts his focus, sets the camera movements to ensure proper perspective of the circular faces of the round watches and looks for proper placement of the specular highlights on the background surface. Pleased with the placement of the watches in his frame, Collins slides the 4x5 aside, giving him plenty of workspace to add a string of pearls. Working as a subliminal prop, the pearls not only identify that they are dress watches, but also carry the theme of spherical shapes throughout the photograph. Having previously marked the support arm position by number, Dean can easily return the camera to the exact same position and composition every time. 
A calumet exposure calculator, or two-inch rule, is set in the subject area to check for light loss from the bellows extension. The ruler, placed on the ground glass, measures the light loss in f-stops relative to the incident meter reading. Dean Collins explains. We actually expanded this watch larger than it was in real life. It's uh, a little bit more than a one-to-one -one, um, increasement. Uh, we're going to go to what's called Bell's Extension, meaning that we're actually going to amplify the product bigger than it was designed for the lenses. We actually go into what's called Bell's Extension, to where the image is expanded over a larger area of the film plane than the apertures were designed to compute. So we'll go into a extension factor. There's several ways of computing that. There's ways of multiplying the square of two, on and on. We find the easiest one is to buy, uh, for about five bucks, this little device called the two-inch rule from, uh, from uh, Calumet. And it's a little piece of cardboard or plastic that has white on one side, black on the other. And you're going to put it in the set relative if it's a white uh, set. You're going to put it in the black side. If it's a black set, you can put it on the white side so you can see it. You put it right on the area of focus to where you are focused on and then you take a small little rule and measure on the back of the ground glass and it tells you what the extension factor is going to be. It's going to say from what your meter's reading, open up a half a stop, a third a stop, two stops relative to how much extension is there. An incident meter reading is taken to set a hypothetical 18% value in the subject area. The first reading reads F45 at ISO 80, which is what Collins wants, but with the two stop bellows loss, Dean must increase the power to the strobe by two stops. The second reading reads F90, and with the two-stop bellows loss, F45 will give the correct exposure. Dean dials in his F-stop on the scenar. Collins pulls a sheet of Polaroid 59 from his cabinet and loads it into the 4x5 film holder for his first Polaroid check print. The scenar P2 automatically closes the shutter when the film is loaded. By depressing the shutter cable release, the aperture is shut down to the preset opening and the exposure is made. The first Polaroid reveals that although the watch faces are washed out, the overall exposure is correct. Collins will first work on the transition from the specular highlight to the diffused highlight on the background paper. Collins now lowers the strobe head closer to the vellum for a faster light fall off and positions the burst in the lower part of the photograph so that the gradation from top to bottom is more evident. Once the position of the strobe is decided, a flag is dropped in to protect the lens from any ambient light from the overhead scrim. Small gobos are then cut from black matte cardboard and an assistant places the gobos directly on the vellum to block out the specular highlights on the watch faces. Our second check print reveals that the gobos are not shadows, but reflections that reveal the diffused highlight or true tonality of the watch faces and black leader paper. When you work with light qualities, we'll call it three-dimensional contrast, there are basically three densities you'll work with. You'll work with the diffused density, You'll work with the specular density and you work with the shadow. And the diffuse density, uh, if I can just call it, is the true tonality. Uh, in this case, on the, let's say the surface of the paper that we're taking a picture of this watch line on, the true density of that paper was black. So the true exposure would be black. The specular highlight is the brightness that shows surface quality. It shows that it's smooth and it's shiny. It's usually brighter than the true brightness. And then the shadow is the area which receives less illumination than the diffuse, which is darker than in the true tonality. So you'll say the specular is brighter than the true tonality, the uh, shadow is darker than the true tonality, and the diffuse highlight is the true tonality. There are edge transfers between them. Not only are there contrasts to the diffuse, but there is the gradation point between the diffused and the specular highlight. In this case, uh, let's say, let's identify the surface of the, uh, the paper, and you see that there are dark spots uh, caused by these little gobos that are above the watch. Well, they're designed to clean up the face, the reflections of the watch, so you could see the true tonality of the watch face, which was black. If you didn't put those little gobos in there, you'd have washed out faces. You couldn't see the watches at the hands. You couldn't see the face of the, anything about the way, uh, what the watch looked like. And that's not good for an ad. I mean, nobody's going to want to buy that watch if it's all flared out. So we put the little gobos in there, cleaned up the face of the watch, but also on the surface, uh, or on the surface below of the watch, you saw these 
dark circles show up. Well, they're a dark circle, and people say, well, that's a shadow. It's not a shadow, it's a diffused highlight. It's a true tonality of black leader paper. And then you see this edge transfer, which goes into, uh, from, from, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter until now it's washed out, and that's the leader paper. That creates what we'll call tonalities and shapes. Artists have done that for years with pencils and carbons and on papers, and they've created shapes and forms. We are identifying a transfer edge there between the diffused and the specular. We are controlling it by several modes. The one this time, uh, that we're picking on is surface efficiency. Instead of using a plexiglass below it, like a lot of people will put that on plexiglass, if we put it on plexiglass, you'd see a perfectly sharp, cut out, in focus little dot. But working with leader paper, which has a little bit of a reticulated surface to it, it created a very soft transfer from the diffused to the specular and created a much more comfortable shot with this per particular graphic design of, of the round shapes of the pearls and the roundness of the watch. We just added one more symmetrical form to that. Collins and his crew agree on the placement of the gobos and decide to move on to the task of defining the true design features of the watches. A large foam board reflector is placed in front of the watches to define the base edges of each watch. Note the front and back edges of both watches and the added surface definition to the pearls. The large foam board is needed to reflect and define the entire round mirror edge of the watches. A smaller source would not cover the entire edge of the watches. Remember, the foam board creates a specular highlight in the watches and is not a reflector fill. Collins drops in a second, smaller foam board behind the watches to define the top edge of both the ladies and the man's watch. Dean Collins explains the concept. This entire shot is nothing more than an exercise in specular form, uh, specular and diffuse form. There is not a shadow in the entire shot. You'll look at the black dots on the surface, uh, uh, those black circles, people say those are shadows. They aren't shadows. They're diffused highlights. Uh, they'll, look at, um, they'll look at the face of the watch. Well, you have to identify that it's a black face of the watch, so that's diffused highlights. The reflections in the gold are specular highlights. So everything in it is either edge transfers between diffuse and specular or contrast between diffuse and specular. When I brought the reflector boards in from the top and the bottom to fill in and show actual form, those are specular highlights. Now, specular highlights in their actual terminology means mirrored image of the device that creates the highlight. If I would have put a blue card in there, those would have showed up as blue, uh, blue reflections. So it would look like you painted blue forms in there. So by putting white boards in there, it showed the true reflection uh, of white, which is reflecting off of gold, which gave a light gold effect. So it is, a, it is an exercise in contrast that the common labor, the common person, does not normally see. This is the, probably the purest form of commercial photography I know in light control because we're controlling reflections on surfaces, which is uh, pretty unusual. Nothing between highlights and shadows here. It's between diffuse highlights and specular highlights. Collins now makes some last second adjustments before putting his final exposures on film. Dean double checks each of his camera operations and with the crew watching on, makes his final exposures. Our final image is a pleasing composition of simple elegance with good detail in the watch faces and true color and form throughout. A review of the techniques Collins used shows us that by moving the light source in close to the vellum, we can control the rate of gradation on the background, but at the same time, it creates a mirrored image of the light source on the crystals. Our specular gobos remove specularity from the face of the watches and create a pleasing background design while also staying within the theme of shapes. With the addition of the first reflector board, detail is revealed in the front edge of the ladies' watch and the back inner edge of both watches. Surface definition is also added to the pearls. Our final reflector board defines the back edges of both watches and completes the evolution of our photograph. Dean Collins adds some final comments. If you really look at the shot and its, its, its total concept and application, you'll find that it was done with nothing more than architectural vellum, a couple of reflector boards, a light source identified to distance, creating certain specular qualities, transfer qualities, and uh, finally a view camera. Uh, we use the best equipment we, you know, we have. Uh, we use bronze, we use, we use CNRs, very good optics to record it and to create the light. But the actual light qualities were created by, by identifying what you have to work with. It isn't just highlights to shadows, it's specular to diffuse to shadow and transfers between them. And if you start thinking that way, you can start producing a, a much better two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. 
And that's really what it comes down to, is when people look in those magazines, they want to know everything about that watch. They want to know its surface quality, that it's gold, that it's round, that it has these cut edges, that the, the band was a, was a good leather material instead of just some naga hide. They want to know everything about it. So your job as a commercial illustrator is to show true depth and true roundness of a three-dimensional object, but you're only allowed to use a two-dimensional representation of it. Eye-catching clarity and product definition were the objects of this illustrative shot, designed and executed by Dean Collins. Entitled Levitation, this photograph has the look of expensive retouching, but the final image is actually completed on a single sheet of film, with the help of a little Collins magic. We were originally commissioned by Calumet Photographic to, uh, to shoot this, this particular shot for the cover of their catalog. So we had two things to, to, to overcome, you might say. First of all, we had to deal with a photographic product in a photographic environment uh, to identify what's inside the, the, the catalog, to say that it is a photographic catalog. And secondly, we had to produce an image which was uh, so interesting and so unique that uh, people that make a living producing interesting imagery would want to look at it. Uh, that's where the neon concept came in and the, uh, the actual floating suspension aspect uh, makes photographers inquisitive, like, gee, how was that done? So they would open the publication up and find out, you know, the concept of what was in, inside the catalog. Entering the Fine Light Studio, assistant Kevin Scott Schumacher begins to set up for the first stage of this two-part shoot. An 8x10 camera is mounted on a tripod to act as a stand for the subject of this first exposure. The highly polished 360mm Kaltar lens is then set into place as Kevin begins the task of lighting the reflective surface. A triangular light box constructed of three Lightform P22 panels is set directly in front of the lens. Two layers of translucent fabric create the main diffusion panel, while the two remaining panels contain the light and act as gobos. A bare bulb Pulso 4 strobe head is placed on a light stand and set inside the light box, facing away from the translucent panel. Because the inside of the box is lined with white reflective fabric, the strobe light will bounce off of the back of the box and produce a soft, even illumination on the panel. This bounce box approach to lighting highly reflective objects eliminates the problem of hot spots that may show up on the surface of the product. Lightform double clips are used to secure the back of the light box and contain the light. The strobe is connected to a Pulso 4 power pack, which Kevin sets to the appropriate power. Single clips are used to pull wrinkles from the diffusion fabric that may show up in the photograph due to the extreme specular resolution of the highly polished lens. With the basic setup complete, Collins rolls the Phobos stand into place with a 90 millimeter lens on the 4x5 camera. The flat black wall will serve as a background for the photograph. Collins then locks the camera stand into a solid position to begin his work. Working with a black product on a black background, a viewing hood is added to the 4x5 for viewing ease. Collins knows that his camera would not normally carry focus across the entire face of the lens, so he uses a swing on the camera. By utilizing this effect, the plane of focus can be shifted to the critical areas of the product that would otherwise fall out of the depth of focus. This is known as the Scheimflug effect. 
Collins turns the Kaltar lens so the product name can be easily seen and then checks his focus and the position of the lens on the ground glass. A white card is held behind the product lens for easy viewing as Collins adjusts the horizontal support arm on the camera stand for perfect positioning. With the elements set in position, Dean directs his assistant Kevin to move the light box until the optimum specular coverage on both the metal rim and the glass element is achieved. Working from the final image, a highlight of the lens reveals the specular qualities that the large source of illumination provides. The studio lights are dimmed so Collins can use a flashlight to make a final check of critical focus on the front and the back of the lens. But I can't pick it up. Okay. Neil, put me on the back. Check the background there. An incident meter reading is then taken with the dome of the meter facing the light source, and Collins finds that he is more than two stops off of the F45 reading he needs to carry focus. He increases the power to a full 3,200 watt seconds. Okay, can we just hold it back it up a little bit? Next, a calumet exposure calculator, also known as a two-inch rule, is held in the subject area to determine the bellows extension factor. The exposure ruler, which is placed on the ground glass to measure the image size, shows a one and one-half stop light loss. A second, more concise reading reads F45, but with the one and one half stop bellows factor, stop Collins must stop fire his strobe three times, three times, which equals a one and one half stop increase in light to retain his depth of field at F45. An aperture of F45 is dialed in on the four by five. The camera is loaded with Polaroid for the first check print. The shutter will remain open while the Pulso power pack automatically fires the strobe three times and then resets itself for the next exposure. Collins uses Polaroid 55 positive negative film when shooting dark objects such as a lens. When backlit, this film shows greater detail in the blacks, enabling a photographer to see any problems in the darker areas of the film. Do, but I think if you would take the black belt, so just uh, we're gonna drop some reflectors right in here and right in here, and just to open up those both those sides. Do you have the negative. Dean also examines the Polaroid negative with a high-powered loop to check for critical focus in the image. Yeah, yeah, front and back's fine. Front's real, real sharp, sharp. Just a little tack out in the back. Collins talks about lighting the highly reflective lens. The actual, we'll call it um, framing lenses, the one top and bottom, were kind of difficult uh, to, to record on film because they weren't going to have a neon around them. They weren't going to have their own shape separated out from the background. So we had to really produce what we'll call lighting contrast on them. There was tonal contrast on them. I mean, it's a black lens, and this black lens has white lettering, so you have black and white already there. But to create shape and roundness on this lens, we had to work with specularity, shine within the uh, material. So working with the white, uh, uh, the proper white reflective materials, silver reflective materials around her to create shine surface to show that it is a round lens, that it wasn't flat, was probably the most difficult thing about these two exposures. And we were so, so close to it. So uh, we were in close, we're trying to carry depth of field from the front to the very back edge. Uh, so we had to work with the best camera movements possible and we had to carry the maximum depth of field with our f-stops. We had to shoot it all at f45. Uh, After viewing the first check print, Dean decided that a black velvet bib was needed to cover the base of the lens. To create the needed specular highlights on the barrel of the lens, Collins uses tiny silver reflectors, which are small pieces of cardboard cut from a Polaroid box. By correctly placing the reflectors, specular highlights are created to add proper dimension and roundness to the barrel of the lens. Now ready for his second check print, Collins will take the same exposure twice on the same sheet of film. The first exposure will place the image of the lens on one edge of the film. By removing the camera back and replacing it upside down, 
the second exposure will occur on the opposite side of the film. This will enable Collins to check the positioning of the lenses and that there will be sufficient space for the floating optic in the center of the photograph. The second check print is a success, and Collins will move on to prepare for stage two of the photograph. Bring the Caltar back around. With a small sheet of clear acetate attached to the ground glass of the camera, Collins traces the outline of the lenses to create a reference guide for the placement of the center lens. Dean Collins explains the technique of camera registration. There's two ways of registering these images together. You can either have two cameras separate set up, or you can have one camera with a very good studio stand. In this case, we use one camera with the FOBA. One thing about the FOBA stand is that everything has been marked out. Uh, any movement, any placement, you'll see along this, you'll have uh, every last millimeter has been marked out. So if you keep a documentation of where those are and you do not move the stand from the floor, you just move the camera around to another spot, you can, within a, within a half a centimeter, bring it back in the exact position and, and line it up to where you can take one exposure and then move it around and put another exposure on the same piece of film without ever taking uh, the camera off the stand and moving it around. It's a real quick way of, uh, of produce precise registration between two images. By noting the registration numbers on the camera stand and camera, Kevin creates a series of location points that will enable Collins to return to his exact position for the final exposures. With registration complete, the camera is swung to the opposite side of the studio to begin work on the second and most complex part of the photograph. Collins begins by switching from a bag bellows on the 4x5 to a standard bellows for use with a 210mm lens. Four clamps are then used to secure a sheet of clear plexiglass to two light stands. Weights are added to each stand to ensure that the plexiglass will not move once set in place. Next, a threaded aluminum bar is bolted into a hole that was previously drilled in the center of the plexiglass. The plexiglass is then cleaned thoroughly for the photograph. With Kevin holding the lens, Collins carefully hot glues the lens to the end of the aluminum rod. By making sure the support rod is directly behind the lens from camera point of view, the effect of suspending the product is easily achieved. The glue can later be removed with Bestine, a common rubber cement solvent. An empty paint can filled with cement produces a simple studio stand that Collins uses to support a P15 panel with black fabric. The panel will act as a catch for the lens, just in case. To stand flat, and then we gotta find our <whistles> drape. To create an overhead scrim for the lens, a P22 panel with two layers of translucent fabric is attached to two stands with EC1 clamps. Using a boom stand, Kevin positions a bronze color strobe with a parabolic reflector directly over the lens. As Collins sets his shot, a white card is held behind the lens for contrast. 
A view through the ground glass reveals that the lens has been centered and is in position relative to the tracings from the previous set. Two nylon curtains, one translucent and the other reflective, are suspended with double clips on elastic bungee cords to create a light tint. A diagram reveals that by keeping the curtains far enough away from the lens, reflections of the white curtains in the plexiglass can be avoided. Note the specular highlight on the side of the lens, created by the curtain that is now illuminated by a second strobe. Collins directs Kevin to back the strobe up, creating a larger light source and a less intense specular highlight, thus producing the proper ratio of the specular to the diffused highlight. By utilizing a symmetrical strobe system, the power of the modeling light from each strobe enables Collins to set the contrast by eye. Working from a previous incident reading, a test shot is made at F45. Again, note the specular highlight created by the curtain, a relatively small source of illumination. As seen in the diagram, the second curtain acts as a reflector fill, providing detail to the right side of the lens while the large overhead scrim creates a specular highlight on the lens, helping to identify surface qualities and the shape of the lens. Satisfied with the lighting for the first two exposures, Collins begins working on the background neon effect. A P22 frame secured to two light stands provides the foundation for a large sheet of opaque plexiglass held to the frame with utility clips. Black Savage background paper is then rolled down the face of the plexiglass and cut to size. Gaffer's tape is used to fasten the paper to the top and the bottom of the frame. The most difficult part about this shot was produce the exact alignment uh, of the neon effect around the floating lens. That was done by taking the back off of the camera, which was taking the, the picture, taking a hot light, aiming it through the optic, which was going to record the lens, uh, which then projected an exact silhouette of that lens onto a background, which was about six, seven feet behind it, which, which is an opal piece of plastic, a uh, large piece of plexiglass covered with black paper. Uh, then cutting out that silhouette, tracing out that silhouette and cutting it out gave us an exact alignment of where the neon would be. Uh, so during the final exposure, the actual neon effect was even all the way around the lens and it wasn't off one side or the other. The alignment is probably the most difficult thing of any, uh, of any neon effect. To produce an accurate silhouette of the lens on the background, Collins places a 650-watt quartz light directly behind the view camera. To protect the ground glass from heat damage, it has been removed and replaced with a sheet of Roscoe Lux Tough Frost, turning the camera into a projector of light. A change in aperture size directly affects the beam of light, as Collins controls the sharpness of the image, while Kevin works quickly to sketch the outline with a grease pencil. The traced area is then cut out of the paper, leaving the opaque plexiglass exposed. Double stick tape is used to hold the edges of the paper down, producing a clean, accurate outline of the lens. Collins places a third bronze color strobe on a stand and aims it directly at the back of the plexiglass cutout. A Roscoe Lux red gel is added and Kevin turns the modeling on to check the effect. A diagram of the overall setup shows the relationship of each element that Collins used to create the suspended lens and neon effect. The distance from the 4x5 camera to the neon plexiglass is necessary to achieve a soft neon effect by throwing the background out of focus. The large sheet of plexiglass is needed to cover the angle of view of the 210mm lens. The next step is for Collins to choose the f-stop that will produce the desired neon effect for the second of two exposures. 8, 11, 16, yeah, it looks just, it's going to be real... Real, okay, about F-16 is what we're going to shoot that uh, background color on. I think even the blue and, and the red would look fine at 16. So yeah, just right neon. It's, uh, uh, eight's just too, too much glow. I think it'll be real nice and tight neon. Collins selects F-16 16, to produce a clean silhouette of the foreground now. lens and the proper neon effect. 
Again, the distance from the camera to the plexiglass must be sufficient to throw the background out of focus at F16 to create a neon effect. Dean uses a booster two with his Minolta meter to take a reflective reading of the neon directly off of the ground glass. This reading will establish the desired intensity of color relative to 18%. Through the choice of aperture for this second exposure, Dean selects a two to one red or a 36% red. For those without the capabilities of a booster two, a reflective receptacle reading can be just as effective taken from the light coming the through the plexiglass. Exact same value to the tenth of a stop. So yeah, there's no bells at all in this thing. Huh. Check it again. Yeah. Dean Collins okay. explains so the control of colored backgrounds. Uh, the glowing effect of neon is dependent on the aperture that the camera is set at when you take that picture. At F64, uh, you're going to have a very in-focus glow, which the cutout paper looks like a cutout part. Uh, at F, uh, say, F8, it's going to be very out of focus and very, very neon. So depending on your aperture will depend on how much that neon in effect behind the lens uh, is, is going to be. Uh, color zoning, chromosomes, is going to utilize the color control here. What we're going to do is, is if I take a reflective reading off of the ground glass with a booster 2 from Minolta, it's an attachment which goes to our Minolta 3. When you take a reading right off the ground glass, it gives you a reading to set your camera at to make that a middle tone value. In other words, 18% red in this case, uh, or we'll say the value of 1. If we then make the reflective reading come off that reading, something like F22, but we set our camera at F16, well, F22 is going to be twice as bright as 18%. We're going to say a 36% red or a 2 to 1 red. If we consider 18% 1, then we consider twice that a 2 to 1. The lens is being exposed with, uh, at F, uh, Collins prepares F22. to take a test print to check exposure and registration of the neon. The first exposure of the lens is shot at F45 for maximum depth of field. cover this up so I don't show up in the reflection of that plex. Especially these chromium wires can show up so easily. Just about like that, just so I'm out of the frame. Okay, ready? Okay. okay Kevin three. turns off the strobe so surrounding the lens reroute and reroutes the, the appropriate power to the background strobe for a two to one red. The Collins the adjusts the aperture to F16 for the second exposure. During the first exposure, black velvet was draped over the neon cutout to ensure total color saturation of the neon without contamination. Collins makes a second exposure of the neon only. Super. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Just right there. We're gonna have to shave it down. 16. 16. Probably should shoot that at 11. I think we'll get a little bit better neon. Okay. After examining the Polaroid check print, Dean decides to open the aperture from F16 to F11 to create a slightly softer neon. By increasing the aperture, the power of the background strobe must be cut in order to retain the 2 to 1 red. Collins adds a Roscoe Lux one-stop ND gel to the background strobe to cut its power. A problem with exposing two images onto one sheet of film is that you have two possible different exposures. So by running your test on two different sheets of film, expose one image on one sheet, one image on another, develop those two out, find out how far they are from each other in exposure, make sure that they are corrected at the time of their exposure, then you can expose both of those onto one sheet of film and guarantee it when developed out, both of them have the exact exposure necessary. Working for his final exposures, Collins makes six exposures of the suspended lens and neon on film and two on Polaroid without developing them. In this way, Dean can use the Polaroids to check registration of the remaining exposures from the first setup and be assured of perfect registration when he completes the images on film. Yeah. Stay right there. Now ready to add the final two exposures, Collins swings the phobus stand back to the original marks and begins to reset for the shots, which completes the remarkable evolution of levitation. 
there was two difficult things about the shot. First of all, conceiving the shot, then doing it. The conception of the shot was, was really given my responsibility. I, I was hired by Calumet. They said, come up with the shot. You think it up for our cover to create an impact aspect. Uh, many, many hours on airplanes, uh, a lot of time on drawing board, sketching it out in my mind until finally I came up with this, exactly what I wanted it to look like. Then coming up with the physiological restraints, the physiological laws I must follow to come up with the shot, especially when there's not going to be any airbrushing involved. I didn't want any airbrushing involved with this shot. I wanted it to be totally mine. So the proper suspension aspect, how to create a registered neon, how to get just a certain form around the lenses to where I had to separate black from black, um, meaning the black walls from the black lenses to create their full shape and make sure the color value was right on the money was, was really, to me, this is what this was the biggest treat of my career, uh, at least of here recent, is that they've given me a, an opportunity to show my stuff in front of other commercial photographers to grab their attention. And to try to do it totally photographically, was, I think, was one of the biggest challenges. And, and it worked. We're real proud of the cover. It's got a tremendous amount of attention. And, and it makes people open up their minds a little bit about saying, well, you know, I think I, can, I think I should possibly start working a little bit more with my brains instead of with retouchers doing a lot of the work. is not to be scared by the equipment that you see here. Uh, it's the best view camera in the world. It's the best, uh, the best studio stand, the best strobe. But no, those, those pieces of equipment didn't take the picture. What took the picture was the, the concept behind it. <laughs> 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 so take three or four or somewhere in there. The most important. Huh? Yeah, the yeah. most important part. <laughs> it is fucking close. Make sure you just get some eye contact before you start. <laughs> <laughs> get him out of here. Where is Spencer? Oh yeah, it stands, yeah, well, yeah, blank, right? The most important part about the shot is to identify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're gonna sit elsewhere, I'll sit here. Are you Just, rolling? Yeah. Oh yeah, you're gonna be a lot better, Bill. Yeah, I can see this, yeah. Old, old poker face Bill. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> okay, we are rolling. Okay. Right in the wheel. Oops. <laughs> Wait, one more problem. <laughs> Let's talk about the water now. <laughs> hey, we, we need to get this problem. What about this problem? What about this problem here? We're going to the... To review this whole shot is to identify the, the materials used. Uh, we chose the proper uh, architectural vellum for, for because it is a shiny object. We didn't use ripstop for nylon. <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll use the proper. I was on a roll. Yeah, I know. I heard that I was going to try to get past the damn it, the proper architectural development. <laughs> An 8x10 is used in this situation uh, because it's a great sports camera. And I. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Uh, Spence, settle down, will you? <laughs> Just being... Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to your fist okay. now, huh? What? What? Okay.